Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Up Close on METV. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television. And it's our great privilege to have with us today Representative Greg Stubbe from District 73 to talk about this year's session and the unique and significant things that occurred during the legislative session. Representative Stubbe, thank you very much for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to talk about this session. Well, it was an interesting session this year. Yeah, I think we had a, a very good session. In the four years I've been there, it was the first time that we really had an, some additional money in the budget. And in my first two years, we had to cut $6 billion. Mm. So to not have to make significant cuts to the budget, I think, were, were very positive. And I think all in all, it was a very good session. Uh, we had a record budget this year, $77 billion. We were able to give a record amount of money to education that Correct. we haven't been able to do in the past. Not only did we do a, an, an extra um, billion dollars to education last year, but we added on, on top of that. And so we were able to also do that, but we were able to also do $500 million in tax cuts, which I think is very important to Floridians to know that we're trying to give them some of their tax dollars back. $400 million of that was in driver's license and tag right. fee reductions. And then there was another $100 million in tax cuts for various uh, tax cut holidays, like we right. just had the hurricane preparedness mm -hmm. holiday. And then we have the sales tax holiday for um, schools when, when we turn around into August and start our schools again. So all in all, we were able to fund a lot of things that we ha hadn't really been able to fund at the levels that we needed to in the past and we're able to give some money back to taxpayers and I think that's a, a good thing for us to be able to go up there and do. And, and on top of that, there's a surplus. Uh, significant uh, m money went to uh, fund balance too for, for years to come. Yeah, we actually put, on top of all the other things that we did, we were able to put $3 billion in reserves mm -hmm. and that will help keep our AAA bond rating, which is very important mm -hmm. to the state and, and obviously to uh, the financial steadiness of our state. Well, this year, you know, the, I, I think the, the significant achievement was you know, refunding education because there was a cut in previous years. But being able to put that funding back uh, from K through, not only K through 12, uh, but K through, you know, the college uh, funding as well, that was a really significant achievement. We really hit every level of education funding this year at record numbers. Um, we were able to put the per student um, ratio higher than we have Correct. done before. We were able to give more money to higher education than we've done historically. And I, I think that, you know, we're trying to create a state that can create jobs and economic development, but we also need our citizens to be well educated in order to facilitate those high paying jobs and, and high skilled jobs. So I think it's important to show, and we, we did that this year, the commitment that we have mm -hmm. to both K through 12 and education and higher education. And both the House and the Senate really worked together on this, oh, you know, to find you know these, these additional funding for education. Yeah, well, there was a for the last two years, our our leadership, both the Speaker and the Senate President, have been very good at working together on issues, especially big picture issues like that, and to also have the governor supporting those type of things made made those type of decisions very easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've seen historically where sometimes the Senate has different. Point of priorities view. than the House does, and that really hasn't happened in the last couple of years, which has been good because we've been able to to get some of these big things accomplished. And, and, and it's really a significant you know achievement too to, to put that money back into education. But also, if we could look at the big picture for a moment as well, one of the key things that happened regionally and in, within this community is that there were a lot of additional dollars went to arts and culture this year. Uh, South Florida Museum, um, among others was the recipient of some funding where in previous years they haven't been able to to get that funding. Yeah, like I said, it was nice this year because we had a little bit more money in the budget. So we were able to fund things that have historically been cut. And Sarasota Manatee County, it's no secret that 
the arts and um, those type of activities are exactly. very strong in Sarasota Manatee County. So we wanted to make sure that we tried to fund a lot of those projects as best as we could. And I think we did a good job of doing that. I mean, and there, there's always more that we can do. Um, but I also think it's important to, to provide tax cuts to our citizens mm -hmm. while we still do some of those things. So it's kind of just prioritizing what's important in the community. And I think we did a good job of that this year. But, and, and I think you know, there are a lot of the organizations that got funded this year are very appreciative of the level of effort that the delegation put in to determining you know, this is good for funding. This is a significant uh, organization within the community and it needs to have some state funding. And that was a, a great achievement. And the good thing about our delegation, both Manatee and Sarasota, we all work very, very well together. So it's, and we're all kind of in different buckets, if you will, of mm -hmm. responsibilities through our committees and the things that we're involved with. So we have a very dynamic legislative delegation that works very well together so we can accomplish those type of issues and goals that we want to do. Well, let's take a moment to, and discuss that with the, the local delegation. Uh, Senator Galvana sits on the Education Appro Appropriations Correct. Committee. Uh, Representative Boyd is like government operations. Chair, he's now chair of state affairs. And, and which is a, a great achievement for, for uh, for him, and you were vice chair of both the regulation and professional business and professional regulation, and then the health innovation subcommittee, which are two you know significant committees. And we want to talk a little bit about those uh, uh, in a moment. But I want to talk uh, about some of the things that you were directly concerned with and some of the things that you were responsible for during this session. And one thing that came to mind right away is the, is the communication services, or the E911. E and, and if you could tell us briefly why that was important and, and the achievement of this bill. Yeah, for two years I've worked on the next generation 911 legislation. And um, what, what that is, is everybody who has a cell phone, if you post pay, which mm -hmm. most people post pay, they have Verizon or AT&T, you right. pay a 50 cents per month tax that goes directly towards the 911 services of that county. So mm -hmm. if you live in Manatee County, that money goes directly to the 911 center in Manatee County to fund right. 911 operations. So when you call 911, there's somebody there. What's been happening over the past five to ten years is the funding for the 911 centers has been going down because the pre the postpaid phones like we use right. are kind of going out of style, if you will, and there's more and more people buying prepaid phones. So the disposable cell phones at Target and Walmart, going to Metro PCS and just buying a phone and then buying minutes as you want minutes. There's more and more people doing that, and those people on the prepaid phones, there was a moratorium on the taxation of those folks so no for one several was, years. So no one was paying any taxes on So them. those individuals that have those type of plans weren't paying for 911 services, so the funding to the 911 service industry was severely decreasing. So what we did was we made it fair across the board and actually lowered the tax. So we took the tax from 50 cents per month to 40 cents per month ensure that all any type of phone, whether it be landline, which landline's been paying for years, right. whether it be landline, cell phone, prepaid, postpaid, all pays the tax now for 50 to 40 cents to ensure that the level of funding for our 911 center stays, and actually it's hopes over the next few years that that will increase. Right. And the purpose behind that is to be able to do the next generation 911 things that is important, I think, for a state our size, things like being able to text 911. Exactly. Right now we don't have those capabilities because the funding's not there. Right. When the Boston bombing occurred, the only way that the 911 center got the information that they got because so many calls were coming in and the circuit was shut down was because people were able to text 911. Exactly. So I think it's important for us to have those capabilities here in Florida and um, other things like video. If you take video on your phone, we had the, the technological capability exists for you to take that video, send that to a 911 operator. They can forward that to a fire department if it's a fire. Mm -hmm. And so the fire department responding to the scene knows exactly what they're walking into. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of very cool next generation type 911 services that we can provide, but the funding hasn't been there. Well, hopefully with the additional of the prepaid tax now that the funding will be available for, you know, to undergo these kind of innovations. Yeah, and the, the bill passed unanimously both in the House and the Senate, Which and we're hoping that um, the, the, governor, the governor hasn't received the bill yet, but we're hoping that when he does, he, he'll sign it. Well, uh, and we want to talk a little bit about the governor a little bit later and, you know, his leadership, but I want to move on a couple of things. Now, you were involved in a... In a 
and, and critical to a certain bill that came up. And it kind of started out as a, as a family law right. type of provision that you wanted to have passed, uh, judicial notice, uh, you know, for, for family. And, and as an attorney and as a practicing attorney that involved in family law, I'm, I'm sure this was a, you know, a very important bill for you. However, that bill took on a life of its own mm -hmm. with the inclusion of an amendment. Can you, can you tell us a little bit yeah, about that, that was, and why that turned into such a kind of a, a, an important issue? It's interesting how the legislative process works because things get tacked on and amended to other bills that you never would think would That have would, no, would no would connection. Happen. Yeah. Uh, for, again, two years, I worked with uh, Chief Judge Hayworth on a judicial notice bill that would allow family law judges to take judicial notice of certain things in emergency type cases. Right. And it's really important in domestic violence type situations exactly. or any family law emergency cases for the judges to be able to do that. And they haven't been because the statute wouldn't allow them to. So that was the bill. It passed the House unanimously, went to the Senate. And in the Senate, a, um, an amendment got put on that would allow any person, any illegal immigrant who has been present in the state for more than 10 years who has passed the bar to be admitted as an attorney in our state. And so that got put on in the Senate and got sent back to the House and I had to deal with that. And it was, I, I spent a lot of time researching that issue. Mm -hmm. And what I found first was that statute 455.10 specifically states that any profession that any individual wants to be involved in, any business or profession that's regulated by the state of Florida, they will be able to do that regardless of their immigration status. So if somebody was uh, an accountant or a physician, they still can practice? A brain surgeon today could be an illegal immigrant as far as the federal laws are concerned and mm. be able to practice as a brain surgeon in the state of Florida pursuant to current law. Mm. And so that was the first thing I looked at. And then the next thing I looked at was Chapter 454 specifically says that we, the legislature, delegate to the Florida Supreme Court to, to unilaterally decide who attorney, what attorneys are admitted and not admitted to the practice of law in our state. And then the Florida Supreme Court on this issue opined that they would give this individual the ability to practice law, but they didn't have statutory authority to do it. So that came back to your court. So that came back to me. And I think it's important now that you kind of have a basis in the law to know the facts. This individual that this, this bill and, and this opinion was brought for was brought over here to the United States when he was seven by his parents. Mm -hmm. His parents overstayed a valid visa. Mm -hmm. And when they overstayed that visa, he now became an unlawful occupant of our country. He stayed, his parents are now back in Mexico. He went to undergraduate studies, he went to law school, he got his law degree, he took the bar, he passed the bar, and then when asked to be admitted into the bar by the Florida Bar, they asked the Supreme Court, and that's where, where, where we ended up today. I think another interesting point in my research is that this individual, because his parents overstayed their valid visa, he is not eligible to apply for citizenship in our country. He so, would have to go back to his home country, in this case, Mexico. Correct. And, and the process would begin for him from the very beginning. He'd have to apply or stay in his country. You know, that, uh, I mean, that's a long process. And for 10 years, he for would have to years. move back. And my understanding is that Mexico won't take him back because of his citizen status. But he would have to go back to Mexico stay there for 10 years, and then after the 10 years, then reapply and be sponsored to reapply for citizenship in our country. So that's quite the process. So that's kind of the background. And then the bill came back to the House, and I put an amendment onto that amendment in the Senate. And the amendment that I put on stated that they had to be legally authorized to work in our country and have official authorization from, um, it used to be INS, now it's the Immigration um, Department. They have to be legally authorized to work here. They have to have a social security card and be issued a social security right. card and therefore be paying taxes. And they also had to, if a male, registered for selective service. So, so you kind of frame that uh, with those provisions, with those specifics, into, into the provision how this individual can move forward. Correct. On top of the fact that they would have to be living, residing in the country for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and pass the bar exam. Right. So all of those things, so we, it passed the House. I put those, those uh, additional criteria on there. It passed the House. It went to the Senate, and the Senate passed, passed it out. Um, the governor actually very quickly signed that bill, and I haven't heard when the Florida Supreme Court is going to allow this individual 
into the practice of law. But when you understand what the law is and what the facts are, it, it's really hard to come to a different conclusion as to what we should have done in that circumstance. But uh, I was, it, it was interesting to be involved in that because I never had anticipated being involved in that debate. But that's but, kind of the background. But I, I, and I think your, uh, your comment about you never really know what's going to be tacked onto your bill, and then you came and tried to find the solution, to some kind of uh, logical solution uh, for this individual. Yeah, I certainly didn't think... I should stand in the way of the will of the Senate, the will of the Florida Supreme Court, and the current state of the law. So I just tried to find a way that I thought was fair mm. and that put all of these additional restrictions on it to, to enable this, um, this bill to go through the process. Well, another issue that, uh, that you carried has certainly gotten a lot of publicity and a lot of uh, misinterpretation, and that's your school safety bill. Um, your school safety bill actually passed the House. Is that correct? Yeah, this year, well, the first year I filed it, um, unfortunately we didn't get a, it passed two committees, but we didn't have a full, uh, the full House wasn't able to vote mm -hmm. on it. This year the full House voted on it. It passed two or three committees, and with bipartisan support in every committee, and in the, on the floor there was Republicans and Democrats that, that voted for the bill, and it passed the House. Well, Representative, you know, for the sake of clarity and for understanding, you know, what does the school safety bill actually uh, state? Yeah. Uh, because there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding, uh, I would suggest, about what this bill entails. Yeah, and, and let me first lay a fa framework, too, that I think is important for people to understand as to why I think this is important. If you look at the facts, in two, 2001, the Federal Department of Education and the Secret Service did a study on school shootings. Mm -hmm. And what they found were three very important things. There was a, it's a huge memorandum, but yeah. the, the important findings are this. The majority of school shootings are resolved by somebody other than law enforcement. That the, the majority of these incidences occur in less than 15 minutes. And as Sandy Hook showed us, a, a good number of them, I think about 40% occur in less than six minutes. Mm -hmm. In Manatee and Sarasota County, there's not a single school resource officer at any of our elementary schools. And because of the state of state laws, a concealed permit carrier holder or anyone is forbidden from carrying a, a firearm on school grounds. Correct. The average response time in Manatee and Sarasota County for a call for service is six to 11 minutes. So if you now know what the research shows, that mm. it's going to be, these things are gonna occur in less than six minutes. For example, Sandy Hook, that individual walked in, shot 20 kids, killed 20 children, killed six administrators, did all of that in less than four minutes, and then killed himself, and then two minutes later, law enforcement came in the door. Mm -hmm. he, he had killed himself before law enforcement even walked into the door. Yeah. So in my opinion, it's important to keep our children safe and ensure that somebody is there properly trained to be able to respond mm -hmm. to, God forbid, a shooting in the state of Florida mm -hmm. if somebody comes onto campus. So with that background, what we drafted this year, which was the bill was supported by the Florida Sheriff's Association, the Florida School Boards Association, the Florida Association of School Administrators, mm -hmm. and what it did was it would allow, and it would be completely optional to the school board. So it wasn't us saying you have to do this, it was the state so saying. So any school board you know, in, in, in any district can say, you know, you know, this works for us, but another school district doesn't have, Correct. To, it doesn't have to adopt it. Like in Miami-Dade County and Broward County, they have an SRO in every one of their schools, so mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't take advantage of it. That's mm -hmm. fine, they don't have to. But in school districts like in Manatee and Sarasota County, where our elementary schools don't have an SRO, they may want to take advantage of the mm -hmm. program. So it's completely optional. And what it allows them to do is if the individuals are former or current law enforcement in good standing, mm -hmm. former or current military in good standing, mm -hmm. and go through a training course put together by the Criminal Justice Standards Training Commission, which is the same training commission that develops the school resource officer training. Mm -hmm. If they go through all of those things, mm -hmm. and then the, the principal can recommend to the school superintendent, and then the superintendent may designate them to As carry a, a concealed firearm during their time of employment at the school. Mm. So, I mean, uh, this would seem to me, in, in this day and age, you know, of, of uh, limited resources, where school resource officers aren't always available at right. every school, this would seem to me, you know, as a practical way to help protect uh, children, and, and very vulnerable children at that. What, are, what do you hear are your, the objections to, uh, to this? Well, I mean, obviously you're always going to have people that have a complete aversion to guns mm -hmm. and think that the guns shouldn't be uh, in schools. Mm -hmm. And I, my response to that is, like, I, I spoke with somebody with the, P, the national PTA is adverse to guns in schools at all. And I said, mm -hmm. well, what about school resource officers? They carry guns. Mm -hmm. 
oh, well, we don't support that either. So they actually think that SROs shouldn't even ha and carry guns. And so if people are properly trained, I don't mm -hmm. see why we have so many concealed permit carriers in our state, and you can go to banks, you can go to malls, you can go walking outside, you can go just about anywhere, mm -hmm. and anybody with a concealed carry permit could be carrying in our state. Just about anywhere. Correct. The only places you can't is a courthouse, and there's bailiffs there that are armed, mm -hmm. or a government building, and there's security there that is armed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's pretty much nowhere that you go mm -hmm. that there's not some type of firearm and people trained that can respond to an incident. Well, and you know, God forbid that there ever is an incident. You know, it would seem to me that having you know a quick response and somebody that can respond to uh, to such an incident would be a critical part of it. And that's the whole precipice of the bill is to allow that somebody be there that's properly trained to be able to respond to an emergency. Mm -hmm. Because six to 11 minutes, as mm -hmm. the facts and history will show you, is mm -hmm. way too long to wait for law enforcement to show up. And, and, you, know, and you, know, you never know. I mean, that's the thing, you, know, you never know. Now this year, uh, you know, the bill died. You know, mm -hmm. It didn't go anywhere. But, but you're gonna bring this back. And if you're gonna bring this back, what revisions and or options are you looking at you know to strengthen the the its uh, chances for passage what i would like to do uh, the the substantive part of it is going to stay the same but what i would like to do is try to find some funding to create a statewide trust fund for school resource officers for yeah. schools like Manatee and Sarasota County who can't afford an SRO or our rural districts exactly. who they can't afford in our rural schools and our rural areas across the state to hire SRO. So what I would like to do is take the bill that I had and couple that with some SRO funding and then still pass the legislation the way I had drafted it, but also put some funding in for SROs. And then again, the school district would have the option because quite frankly, having a military background, if something did happen and that SRO is by himself, I guarantee you he'd want some backup there. Sure. So not only could you have an SRO in the school, but you could take advantage of this program if the school district felt that it would add to their school safety plan. And I think school safety is a critical thing that most school districts, all school districts, are very, very involved in, and they want their children, all children, to be protected. Um, I want to move on because you know, we're kind of running to... This year you were involved in a lot of programs or a lot of bills that you know obviously got a lot of press. And one of those was the craft brewer thing. Right. And I, I, if we could, I want you to take a little time. First of all, it's a very complex system. It is. It's very complex. It's multi-layered. Uh, you know, and I think you know we've heard you speak before discussing uh, the intricacies of how it's this three-tiered system uh, is involved, and also the fact that you know the, these are people, the craft brewers especially, entrepreneurs who need to you know want to do a good business and you know have a, a kind of a public following. This is another issue that uh, you took under your uh, wing. Yeah, as the vice chair of business and professional regulations, we did a proposed committee bill, and I carried that legislation from the committee that addressed all of the craft brewer issues. And um, kind of back up, the, Florida has a three-tiered system, as you right. said. So you're either a wholesaler, a distributor, or a retailer. And under law, you can't really go into different tiers. And the craft brewers arguably are in two tiers because they – have a vendor's license to be able to sell alcohol at their location, mm -hmm. but they also are brewing beer as a wholesaler right. and sending it to a distributor. So it was quite an issue as to how we deal with that. And unfortunately in Florida, we treat our wineries, our distillers, and our brewers all very differently. And I, I really don't understand why, but it's very different how we do it. And so the bill this year for the craft brewers would have basically put into law what they're doing currently under, on, under current law. Mm -hmm. Right now, DBPR, the, the Division of Business and Professional Regulation, is right. issuing them vendor's license to be able to sell beer on their place of establishment. So right. it would have allowed them to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. It would allow them to, to work together with other craft brewers. Mm -hmm. It would allow them to have unlimited guest taps. It would allow them to have um, another location where they could have growlers right. and sell just if, if you come into in no with growlers a 64 ounce um, takeout uh, type of uh, yeah under bottle. current law a 32 ounce is legal in a gallon so you could walk into a, a, any place that has a license technically a 7-eleven if they had a keg there 
and fill up a gallon milk jug <laughs> of beer and take it home with you if you wanted. But for whatever reason in 64 Florida, ounces. 64 ounces is unlawful, which doesn't make any sense to me again. So that was also part of the legislation was allow these craft brewers, which apparently in, in that area, 64 ounces is kind of the ideal size, mm -hmm. to be able to, to fill up 64 ounce growlers. That bill would have allowed them to do that. Mm. So there was, a, there was a lot of support in the house. Um, it didn't get through the process. Right. Uh, the Senate had a very different version of what they wanted to do. Hmm. So again, another situation where the House and the Senate weren't really on the same page. I do want to do a bill next year on all the alcohol um, issues. The the prohibition against craft distillers, they can only do two, they can only sell two bottles per year at their place of employment. And I, and I think you've that used that example ago. of uh, Siesta Key yep, CS Key Rum, Rum. Uh, you know, that, you know, if they're, a, if they're a, a manufacturer, a distillery, can they sell their rum, you know, as, for people to come in? You should be able to buy, what, one or two or something. Right now, it's only two bottles per year per person, which just seems a little archaic. Mm. And Gal, um, Senator Galvano and I also sponsored a, a package store bill. We are one of the few states in the country that require, if you have a liquor license to sell alcohol, quota license to sell alcohol, so Publix, for example, you have to have a separate building for that. Hmm. So the beer and wine is in the actual main store, mm -hmm. but our, our law requires that you have a separate entrance package store just for liquor. And to me, it just doesn't make sense why we have that. And I, and I think in, in uh, hearing you speak at different occasions, you, you, you've offered to say, let's look at all of these. Some of these laws and provisions and regulations are things that have been in, uh, on the books since the 30s. Since and, after Prohibition. And uh, there, there needs to be a clear and definitive look at this, uh, how to revise these things and bring them in line with you know, new uh, methodologies of doing business. And I want to support these entrepreneurs sure. and these small businesses, whether it be a winery, whether it be a craft distillery, or whether it be a craft brewery. And so we still have to work within the confines of alcohol as a dangerous product, and we need to make sure that it's properly regulated. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we want to support our small businesses that make an investment in our state mm -hmm. to, to produce a Florida product. product. Yeah. So I think it's important that we do that. Well, we're kind of running down on time right now, and I want to give you an opportunity to kind of recap. But one of the things that, you know, we'd like to talk, you know, you, committee assignments come out, you know, when the time of the legislature. And having been the vice chair of two very critical uh, committees this past year, what are you looking forward to? Where do you want to be involved as you move into the new session? Yeah, that's one of those interesting things about how the legislature works. Every two years, it's a complete change in leadership, and, hmm. and everybody's moved around. So I could be... Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah, I could be chairman of healthcare probes. I could be chairman of the business. Who mm. knows? And actually, the speaker could completely change the committees. Mm. It could not be called business and professional regulation subcommittee next year. It could be called something else. Mm. So they can completely change oh. the structure of the committees. They could move them. We used to have what's called a councils, mm. like five councils and sub councils. So it could completely change. So, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to being involved in the same issues that I was mm -hmm. involved in this year. I, I carried a couple health care related bills as well. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I am we'll have to wait and see what the speaker decides to do in placement of, you know, it's my hope that he's going to put people where their strengths are exactly. and where they can best serve the state. So yeah. hopefully we'll, um, we'll figure out where we land. Well, obviously your leadership and, you know, a lot of these methods here is going to be appreciative as the new leadership takes place. So hopefully, you know, you can come back as, you know, and will your assignments be before the session starts? You'll probably know, well, definitely before session, you'll, you may, you probably won't know until after the November election because mm. It's required under the Constitution two weeks after the November election we do organizational session and then that is when all of the committee assignments will be announced. So, Some of the major committee chairmen and positions you may hear of being announced before, before the election. Before, but not before the... But usually the, yeah. they'll wait until after the election, even people that aren't opposed mm. to put out their slate of who the leadership team is going to be. And also one of the big issues, and perhaps you can come back and talk specifically about this at another time, is the Medicaid expansion. Yeah. And recently, you, know, you, you, you mentioned that you didn't see this coming forward in the next session. I don't see it, but it's a totally new leadership now. Mm -hmm. And I, we've had now a couple of years to analyze other states that have expanded and states that have not expanded. Right. And, and 
Florida's Medicaid rules. Mm -hmm. I thought the House's plan that we had two years ago was a very good plan. We didn't expand Medicaid, but we increased and expanded the people that could apply for the Healthy Families Plan exactly. to get some of the medical services that they needed at certain income levels. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that we have plans out there that would work, but maybe after the new leadership comes in, there'll be more of an appetite to see what form of that maybe we could look at. Well, we're interested in kind of following up on that and see where you know, that path takes. What do you see for the next year? What are the, the challenges ahead? What do you see that you're, you, know, you want to be involved in as you move into the next legislative well, session? Well, all of the health care related legislation this year died. The trauma care bill that I co-sponsored, the recovery care suites bill that I sponsored, um, any, the assisted living facilities bill, the um, ARNP bill, everything health care related kind of got put in one big bill at the end of the session. We passed mm -hmm. it out of the House. and either the Senate didn't want to take it up or they ran out of time before we, we ended. So I can imagine there's going to be a lot of health care related mm -hmm. legislation for next year. I do want to get involved, stay involved on the um, craft brewer, the, the liquor licensing type issues. And whatever else happens to pop up as we move into next year, I think the budget is going to be better than it was this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, all signs that I have seen show that the economy is continuing to mm -hmm. improve. And if that happens and people keep coming to our state to, uh, to visit, exactly. you're going to see exactly. an increase in our budget again. And that will allow us to fund, well, do additional tax cuts, which I had a tax cut bill this year, mm -hmm. um, will allow us to fund more tax cuts back to our, our citizens and fund a lot of these programs that we haven't been able to fund over the past couple of years. Well, it sounds like, you know, as you go through the summer, you're going to be prepping again, you know, for that uh, fall uh, session, you know. It's very important to understand, though, that, that this legislative body that you have, I mean, is the leadership that you have is, is very inclusive. They want to hear your thoughts, so they want to hear your, your comments. Do you think that's a correct statement? No, absolutely. Uh, I've never been turned away from talking to anybody in our leadership. And conversely, I, I never have turned away a constituent that has an issue that wants to come and talk mm -hmm. to me about it. So it's the good thing about the legislative process in Florida is it's very transparent. It's very open. Mm -hmm. Citizens can go online to the website and watch past committee meetings, right. watch me presenting bills on the floor, can send us emails, can come and, and meet with us. So it's a very open process that I think is good for Florida and I think it's good for our citizens. And the local uh, body too, with Senator Galvano, Representative Boyd, all of those are a strong thing and a strong advocates for this community for Sarasota and Manatee. Yeah, we're very lucky to have the representation that we have in Manatee and Sarasota County. We have a, a very strong delegation and, and we all work very well together, which I think is good too. Now, if people, uh, your constituents and citizens have comments or, or they want to be in touch with you, you know, they can do that by going to your website or yeah, giving the, you a phone the call. the house website, it's www.myfloridahouse.gov, mm -hmm. and you just go to the list of representatives, find me, click find on you. me, and there's a link right underneath my picture, mm -hmm. and you can send me an email. Right. And that goes directly to my legislative office, and we can respond to that. And we're going to put that up on the on the screen so people can do it. Uh, Representative Stevie, I want to thank you for taking the time to Absolutely. do this and kind of, you know, filling us in on some of these critical issues that not only you're, we're involved in, but also are going to be coming up again. Correct. And we would welcome you back at, you know, future programs to give us those updates, not only on the things that we've talked about today, but also on those other things. So health care is a, a critical thing for this state, mm -hmm. so we'd welcome to get your input and, and talking a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you for be joining us. And thank you for joining us on this special edition of Up Close on METV.